Hello there. Welcome. Another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today, our energy is high, and I'm so excited to have these two amazing people with us in the hot seat today. They're joining us from different parts of the nation, and you'll learn more about that here in just a bit. But we do have Dave and Sarah joining us, and they're here to talk to us about the collaborative leadership model. We're going to learn more about them, and hopefully I'll learn to say your, your last name, Dave, because I didn't even check that before we started. Um, but basic. go ahead. Basic. Okay, fantastic. Well, excited to have you both. Another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We are thrilled to continue these conversations. Thanks to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. My nerd glasses are never far, and I also checked on Sarah, and hers are also right there. It uh, looks like Dave might already have his on, so... <laughs> We are ready for this conversation. <laughs> I also want to give a huge, big shout out to our amazing presenters, presenting sponsors. They allow us these opportunities. Um, and I like to remind you, these are unscripted conversations. So we have a key topic and our partners trust us implicitly uh, to have these conversations. So, so much love and gratitude sent out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. These companies keep us going and growing, but they're really here for you and your mission. So please check them out. They have fantastic services to offer you. Um, they want to be on your team in 2023. So do yourself a favor, do ourselves a favor so that they stay with us and check them out. So thank you to our sponsors. And hey, if you mentioned, uh, or sorry, if you missed any of our episodes, I have mentioned before, we're coming up on 700. That's the big 700. I know you're shaking your head in disbelief. And I am too, because when Julia asked us to do, asked me to do this three years ago, we really thought it would be a two week endeavor. Um, and here we are going strong. So you can find all of our previous episodes, including this one today, and just a few hours later, on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. So if you have one of those smart TVs, you can just say, hey, pull up the nonprofit show. And we're larger than life, depending on the size of your TV, as well as podcast form. So listen to the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. And you can hear this episode just a few hours um, after we, we finish today's conversation. So thank you for waiting so patiently and also saying yes to the invitation. I want to welcome Dave and Sarah. Again, they both join us from different parts of the nation, but they are with Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. You can find their website at ibme.com. Encourage you to check that out. But I'd love for you to share a little bit about who you are and a little bit about the organization. So I'll toss a coin and either of you can just, you know, pick up and run wherever you'd like. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, David. I'm going to start off if that's okay with you okay. and introduce myself. I'm Sarah Wren. I am calling in from Massachusetts um, and I have been a part of IBME's staff team for five plus years. So at this point, I'm the longest running staff member of our team of six. Um, and I'll just say by way of introduction, when I started, I was one of three full-time staff. So we've doubled in size and taken on this collaborative endeavor um, as we have grown. And uh, I'll pass it to Dave. Fantastic. Sure. And I'm joining from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I work on fundraising and business strategy for IBME. Uh, I joined in 2020, so it was just before the pandemic, January 2020, where it was, oh, we have this nice onboarding process, and then we all know what happened in March. Mm -hmm. So, um, but just to share a little bit about what Inward Bound does, um, you know, our primary work is working with teens, um, and we provide this rare opportunity of a um, a summer camp retreat experience that's grounded in mindfulness. So we work with teens 15 to 19 years old. Um, all across the country, we have we have these retreats, um, and it's really connecting with a team that is, um, you know, looking for support, looking for exploring who they are in the world, um, finding some tools to help us navigate um, kind of the stress and anxiety that's inherent now in in our everyday life. 
um, and providing this deep dive into like this pro prolonged insight into yeah who you are and and sharing that with the community. So do you have that for adults because I'd like to attend. <laughs> Yeah, we do have a teacher training program. So that's a year long uh, teacher training program that is for educators and youth serving professionals. Um, and we've also run adult retreats as well. Um, and we find that the tools that we use with the kids are actually the same tools to use with the adults. Um, yes. uh, so, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's it can be a, a really special experience. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Uh, really excited to have you here. I also want to give a shout out to my client, Mindfulness First. I know you're watching uh, Kim and Sunny. So thank you so very much. But you brought this topic to, to my attention. And we're really talking about, you know, um, a non-hierarchical structure, what that might look like as we move forward. Um, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with each of you today, because I think we have a lot to, to think about so let's start off and Sarah, like start by sharing what informed this model, this collaboration model, what informed this to say, hey, that's that's what we like. That's what resonates with us. And we're going to adopt that. So take it away yeah. and share about that. I'm so happy to share about that. <laughs> Um, so the, the beginning of collaborative leadership at IBME predated me. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the, the people who were there before me. Um, the thought was, we know that a traditional nonprofit structure creates strain and burnout. There's a huge amount of burnout in nonprofit culture. And um, because we work in a mindfulness retreat environment, and that's what we're offering and delivering, there was this thought, like, how can we actually make our work together, like administrative, logistical emails, feel more aligned with the work that we're doing, which is whole person centered, collaborative in nature, supportive of each other, and ideally not creating so much burnout that you don't want to do the work anymore. Right. Um, so kind of the, the discomfort of a traditional nonprofit structure is what what started the IB me on this journey and also a real willingness from the small staff to try and do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of what the, the catalyst was and, and also all of the pitfalls of sort of a traditional hierarchic structure where there isn't necessarily feedback flowing. There isn't necessarily decision-making happening by the people who are enacting the decisions. Those sorts of things um, are really what drove us to start considering different a different framework of how to work together. Mm -hmm. I love that. Dave, what would you add to this conversation? Yeah, I, I would add that it took time. It took a lot of time. Um, you know, we before we actually officially dissolved our executive director role, which was the start of uh, 2020, there was three years of kind of incubation and exploring and actually developing a system of of controls and flows that um, we were looking to embody. Um, and so my, I'll just share my own personal place in it was I, that's when I joined, I was the first person hired under the new model where there was no executive director. Um, and I was coming from an organization where I was the executive director. So just to share a little bit about that perspective is that it was for me, you know, I was trying to um, integrate collaborative work into my previous role and just finding that there was limits within the actual system and the structure. Um, so I was actively not only looking, um, searching for this mission oriented work, but also this particular um, way of, of uh, organizational operating model. Um, and so you know, in that time, I'll just share that, you know, for me, it was so refreshing because, you know, to have these cleared, uh, which we'll get into as far as the the avenues of decision making, but also that, you know, through feedback, I could still have a view that you might have in an executive director role of kind of looking at the big picture. Um, but I could offer that up in a way where it was in, in the realm of feedback. And, you know, I'll just say too, like, as far as non-hierarchical is appropriate. And I think it's important to know that there's still concentrations of power. So we're not, you know, the way I always talk about it is we don't have a one mountain peak. We have 
a whole range, a mountain range of, of folks that are in, are, are in leadership. Um, so I think that's something we learned early on was that um, the idea of, of, of this was not a flat organization, but it's just that it wasn't a, a, just a, one, a single peaked or, organization. Thank you for that. I have, again, this is unscripted. So I have a, I have a very genuine question, but I want to, what I consider the elephant in the room, how do funders respond to this, right? Because funder applications, proposals, they say, who's your executive director, right? Like how do funders respond to this model? Yeah. So I can, I can answer that just because I'm, I'm in the funding uh, yeah. fundraising realm for us. I would say it's, it's growing. It, you know, we're we're seeing a lot now. If you, you kind of listen closely, you hear a lot of like co-executive director models kind of yes. popping up. Um, and I think some of our funders that are that work with our organization and are and are uh, connected to our mission are are in a place of like questioning, you know, current paradigm, what's new, what's going to serve kind of the society of the future. Um, so I, th I would say overall, the receptivity has been positive with a lot of questions. And, and it's been on us to be really clear and transparently, you know, on our website, in our grant um, proposals, to be very clear around what we're sharing today was what, um, you know, was the impetus for this model and getting a little bit into the weeds of how it works so that we can build that trust in that this is not only something that um, is interesting and innovative, but it's also a, a competitive advantage for us. So um, well, we try to make that case. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you for that. And, and I think that takes us so perfectly into the collaborative leadership um, and the five core systems. So what are these systems? And I love, I just have to recognize and, and give a call out. I love that mountain range, you know, and that, that really resonates with me. So it's not that there's not decision makers, but it's like, there's not one, there's not one that sits at the top. Um, so thank you for that. Again, for a visual person, I really appreciate that mountain range. So what are the five core systems? So decision-making is one of them. And I think that's a great place to start just to give you a little idea of how, how we do decision-making. We are not operating on consensus. We actually aren't on, aren't operating in that way, which I think a lot of times when people hear collaboration, they think of, um, you know, some sort of consensus model. We distribute decision making among the, the staff team and um, some of our committees. So part of our model, in addition to our staff being collaborative, we also realized in this process that David was talking about that we had to uh, restructure our board and how we thought about our community and our committees also. Who do we want to be making decisions and leading? Um, I think because the bulk of the decision making is held in the staff team, that's the easiest way to describe it. We operate our decision making on a, um, a scaled system. So everybody, every decision that has to be made at the organization has a one. The one is the decision maker. I am a programs person. So for example, I am the one decision maker on um, what sort of communication we share with our staff before a retreat. Um, as the one, it's my job to make the decision. It's my responsibility to make the decision. And it's my responsibility to seek input from those who are twos and threes on that decision. So as a staff team, we are um, regularly discussing who wants to be included in specific decisions and why, you know, if I'm making a decision that is going to impact marketing or in David's case, fundraising and resources, I really want to hear his input on the decision that I'm going to be making. Sure. Um, so we structure things one through five um, in our decision making. And we did, we didn't invent this system of decision making. Um, Frederick Lelou's book, Reinventing Organizations, as well as Mickey Cashtan's work um, in collaborative leadership, nonviolent communication has really strongly informed our system. And I do think we get a little credit because we have really made it our own and it won't ever look the same at any other organization. Um, so when any decision needs to be made, we follow the system of, I'm the one making the decision. I wanna seek input from those who are um, gonna be affected, from those who might have relevant information. 
and from those who might be experts. Those are, that's sort of the way we're thinking about who you might want to ask for advice. Um, and we try and structure things so that the person making the decision is the person carrying out the decision. This is super important to us because that is not traditionally how it happens. If you have a boss who's telling you what to do and you're just executing, that can really create feelings of um, not not non-ownership and um, burnout and resentment and all of those things that we know can happen. Um, David, do you have anything to add on decision making? Uh, no, I, I, great. Great. I can move on to the next one. Uh, and, I, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame these next three. Um, you'll see that they all have flow on the end of it. So this is really, when you look at our model of collaborative leadership, you know, a way to uh, also look is through the lens of a living system. So this is not something that we, we launched in 2020 and it's done. You know, it, we are constantly living into this. So a big part of how we live into it is when I'm introducing the second one is feedback flow. And so feedback is absolutely critical in this model. It, it's how, you know, me and Sarah are talking to each other, how across the team, uh, through, through board members, through committees, and we actually formalize this into uh, a certain cadence, depending on the amount of, um, of relation that you might have with a staff member. If there's someone that you're working intimately with on a day-to-day -day basis, you're probably going to want to have a, a a feedback process with them mm -hmm. once every two weeks, once a month. Um, and basically in that process, um, even if you don't have anything to talk about, even if there's nothing that's just a little bit, oh, there's a little tension here, there's still an invitation to have this connection and go through a process of feedback because things always emerge. But basically we're looking for two things. One is this th this thing that you're doing, it's great. Keep doing more of it. Thank you. You know, sort of that realm of feedback. And then the other realm of feedback is, hey, this thing, this decision that was made or this flow of uh, this, you know, recurring kind of whatever that's happening, it's having this impact. And, and here's something that I want you to be aware of that impact. Um, and also maybe there's a request of maybe there's another way to um to make that decision or, or so forth. So I'll kind of frame it here because I know with time, but feedback flow number two. Sarah. Yeah. Uh we can go to another flow and talk about info flow, which is really like internal communications would be another way to say it in nonprofit language. How are we sharing all of the necessary things that are happening within our team to make collaboration possible? This is really important because in a regular nonprofit, an executive director is really holding all of that. You know, they're meeting with staff members. They are the central gathering point, and then they're directing from there. In our case, we actually need to be communicating with each other in that way. If I'm making a connection that David needs to know about, we have to have that info flow. If there's feedback coming in that I'm hearing, we have to figure out the flows of information that need to get where they're going in order for people to be able to really well collaborate and do their jobs. Um, I also just wanna throw in there, just to add to what David said, we often say that we're like building the plane while we're flying it. This is very much, we're kind of in like our second or third iteration of how we're working together in this way, but that's kind of the beauty of the system is that through feedback flows and information flows, we can make tweaks to the system or big changes. And that's really important to us is that this is not static and we haven't actually figured every single thing out. We're just, yeah. um, you know, oriented towards how things can be more easeful and collaborate better. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So have we gone through the five? Cause I think there's two more, right? Yep, there's two more. Yeah, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the next one quickly. Was um, another key flow is among our resources, and it you know resources in a broad sense, but I, I think to zoom in on uh, monetary resources um, because we don't have that executive director role. You know, our literacy around our budget and how what we're spending and what we're bringing in is important and really be distributed among the staff team. 
Um, so we have a flow of resources in terms of how we're aware of that. And our budgeting process looks a little different than probably other organizations. Um, but you can ask any staff member and they're going to, the amount of knowledge they have about the entirety of our financial model um, is high. And then the other unique thing I'll just share with this is salaries. So, so, so salaries, we actually have complete transparency around our salaries because we are creating the salaries ourselves. We have a six point criteria for how we each, just, how we each go through our own individual process of what our needs are, what the total budget availability are. We also include historical disadvantage and, and, and privilege in, in consideration for that. Um, and we look to have 150% uh, maximum range between the highest and lowest um, salary within the organization. Wow. So there's some pretty like radical things in that, but we have found that process to be extremely um, enlightening for just our overall holding and also our own relationships with each other to have that sense of transparency and vulnerability in terms of, of money, which can be always taboo around. Talking that about. is very vulnerable. And I applaud you for that. I subscribe to transparency, financial transparency. In fact, you know, I'm asked often to share with my network when there's open positions for, for di different organizations across the nation. And, you know, I finally said only if you have the hiring range. Like that's the yeah. only way, you know, for, for many yeah. reasons, but I appreciate that. So we have one more, right? So one more of the collaborative. Maybe the most fun of them all conflict engagement Ooh. is the fifth system, which is, you know, this is a system where we are trying to really be real with each other and work with each other in a way that is meaningful and impactful. And sometimes a feedback flow, sometimes something is not going to completely be copacetic. And that's when we can engage a process of discerning how we can rebuild trust and continue to work together, or how can we mutually agree? How can we get to some sort of agreement about working together in the future? Um, and it's it's ho we're hoping with a conflict engagement system that we're being really clear about power because that's where conflict in organizations happens is, or doesn't happen rather, is when a person in power says, this is how it's gonna be. And the person in, with less power has to just kind of absorb all of that. And we're trying to do things differently to really bring, bring more resources to when there is disagreement or conflict. Yeah. So who can who can recap those five? Because I want to make sure that we've captured them. Decision making, I know is number one. Then we've got three flows, right? Yes. Resource flow, information flow, and feedback, feedback flow. flow. And then the fifth one was the conflict. Yeah, conflict, conflict engagement. And just to okay. frame it, when the flow, when those three flows break down or there's a lack of clarity around decisions being made, that's when conflict arises and conflict you know that can be a a tough word to kind of hold it yeah. can be very you know subtle tension you know so it's not about you know and that and some of that can be already tended to in a feedback flow so we're welcoming that we 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 see conflict as good news because it's it's brought into the open and we have the resources to move through it and and reach deeper understanding. Well, I feel like, and this is an assumption, but I feel like probably some of your core values are transparency and vulnerability, right? And so I am assuming you have to lean into that to really make this make this work. So um yeah. Yeah, you sure do. And it's not easy. It's really, it's kind of an uphill, at least for me, I'll speak for myself in terms of feedback and conflict engagement specifically. Mm -hmm. It's really relearning how to engage in a work setting where there isn't this sort of, you know, distinction between the personal and the professional. We bring our whole authentic selves with us. Yep. Um, and there, it, it is a practice of leaning in and vulnerability. And it's not always easy especially when we're socialized to kind of just, you know, internalize, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to get the work done. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually believe that all of this collaboration is in service to better work together. Yeah. It actually creates a stronger product. 
this is when Brene Brown steps in and talks about vulnerability and, and being in the <laughs> ring, you know, um, yeah. if anyone has a connection to her, of course, we'd, we'd love to have her. Well, let's talk about the model growth. So can this model grow as IBME grows? Is that something that you've considered? Yeah, it is. I, I don't know if I have, I feel like a, a really strong, yes, we can grow to be a hundred staff and have this exact yeah, model. model. But I feel like um, certainly the way of working in collaboration without one person, sort of the executive director in charge is scalable. Um, and there are lots of examples in uh, the two frameworks that I mentioned, reinventing organizations of huge collaborative organizations who have done distributed non-hierarchic decision-making. Um, I think we're up on a challenge we will be soon is that we'll be hiring a seventh staff member and sort of considering um, how this staff member in a more support role, in a role that is more support oriented and less sort of large scale decision-making oriented, how that, um, support, how we use that um, in our model, because currently, as David was saying, with the peaks, we all sort of the six staff members have a scope of decision making. Mm -hmm. um, and so scaling will look a little different. And has this been brought into that trauma informed care lens? Is, is that a lens of perspective? Yeah, I mean, I would say in in the collaborative leadership model, it's not something we have explicitly kind of teased out. It's there, certainly trauma-informed teaching is part of our programs. Sure. That's core to our programs. But I think the the what we're building in terms of the culture and the connection does support a, a process of of tenderly holding the trauma we all have. So you know, having a space where it might come out in a in a way that is supportive um, and that maybe there's some healing involved involved with it. And yeah. other times where we're not as skillful, you know, like that, that that's how, you know, and I think, well, for me, then the question of can this grow? I think as long as we continue to commit to these, the, the core of the model, mm -hmm. it will grow. It has grown with us. It's just to predict where it grows into it. That's actually not yeah. how this, how this actually goes. You know, the, the point is responsiveness. The point is being in relationship. And, and so the more we can be as a whole system, have that, those feedback, those, all those flows, then we learn and, and we have the mechanisms to evolve it. So, um, so I, I do think it can grow in, and, and I'll say like, this is not for, this is not for everybody. You know, this is something that we felt has worked for us and it can take different, different shapes in, in, in other organizations as well. I want to talk to both of you so much longer. I really do. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. Again, this was brought to me um, from one of my clients whom I just adore, Mindfulness First, here in the greater Phoenix area. Um, this is a structure of consideration. I've heard it from other organizations and clients of mine. So thank you so very much for sharing uh, transparently and vulnerably, uh, both of you, Sarah and Dave, for coming on, uh, representing Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. Please check them out. Um, I, I love what you do. Again, I would love to participate in these camps as an adult myself because I, you know, age is only a number when it comes to, to being a kid. So I'm a big kid at heart, but IBME.com is the website here. Thank you so very much again for, for your time, your expertise. Julie and I are so very honored to have you here again. Thank you for saying yes. Um, yeah, and I know, you know, we're here sitting in Q4, busy season. Um, all of us are, are probably stressed, even if we do the work to stay, you know, away from stress. I think it still finds those little cracks and it enters enters our life some way. Um, but again, I am so deeply grateful to each uh, of you for joining me today, your entire team, uh, for allowing you this time as well. I also want to honor our presenting sponsors. They are fantastic partners of ours. So huge shout out of gratitude to our friends over at Bloomering, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy with the National University, 
Be Generous, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, nonprofit thought leader, and the nonprofit nerd. Now's a great time to check out these companies um, because I wanted to make sure that you heard what Sarah and Dave had to offer today. Again, please share this episode with your board, with your volunteers, with your committee members, with your with your staff. Consider this structure. Uh, there's so much to learn in this brief 30 minutes. So again, thank you both so very much. Thank you so much for having us. Pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, for those of you that have joined us live or perhaps tuning in to a recording, thank you as well. We end every episode with this beautiful mantra. We ask you to please stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow for our Friday episode.